So in 2007, okay, we published this Sentinel paper, um, Arvind Segal and I kind of, in which we basically said that we need to think of this problem beyond ductal size. We need to recognize that there are situations, okay, in which if you close the duct, you're probably going to harm the patient. There may be heart dysfunction, there may be pulmonary hypertension, uh, in which the ductus has a biologically important role. We're interested in patients who have big shunts that are leading to physiologic dysregulation, and those perhaps are the patients we need to target. So we propose this model that assessment should not just be about PDS size and directionality, but we need to measure many things that collectively tell us that there's increased QPQS, there's loading of the pulmonary circulation, loading of the left heart, and there's compromise to systemic hypoperfusion. And some people have argued, why do we make this so complicated? Well, I would argue that medicine is about precision. It's about making the right decision. The more superficial the assessment, the less likely you are to be diagnostically precise that there's a particular problem. A PDA physiology is all about volume of flow and having a collection of markers that have the same directionality. So if many of these markers tell you that there's physiologic disturbance, you're more likely to believe that the shunt is a problem. So do we have any evidence that scoring or staging the system has got some value? And we actually do. This was probably the first study that Arvind published um, kind, of, kind of around 2010, where he looked at a small cohort and basically looked at high grade shunts, which would be classified kind of based on that criterion as kind of the, the, the C3, E3, C4, E4 type shunts. And those shunts were associated with prolonged exposure to oxygen and a trend towards increase in BPD. We did not look at chronic pulmonary hypertension in these patients. This data was also subsequently studied in another patient population. And this is the work from the Italian group, Shane et al, um, where they also demonstrated that the presence of a high-grade shunt, E3, E4, was a strong predictor of BPD. And this data is fairly telling. And they basically reported that for every day, you have exposure to a very high volume shunt, the risk of BPD increased by 80%. 8%. So on a weekly basis, that risk was 70%. Again, observational data, however, suggesting that prolonged exposure to high, the highest volume shunt is probably what we're interested in. And that concept was then recently further kind of emphasized by uh, another post-hoc analysis of Ron Kleiman's uh, PDA tolerate trial, where they basically showed that in the intubated patients who have required prolonged intubation, um, who reflect probably a higher risk patient population clinically, who had more prolonged exposure to high volume shunts, there was an increasing relationship with duration of exposure to the more severe forms of BPD. Very briefly, and again, just to, to drift but just to further emphasize the importance of prolonged exposure, I just want to share with you, and, and I know recently many of you would have heard from kind of uh, my colleague, John Klein, about the Iowa data on tiny, tiny babies. And we're, I'm very privileged to lead this program where we have exceptional survival rates at 22 and 23 weeks. But one of the things we were interested in over the last couple of years is to look at the relationship between prolonged exposure to retinopathy of prematurity. And Part of the reason for this study, very similar to the lung, it's important to recognize that the eye is perfused by preductal cardiac output. And as you already know, cardiac output will increase with increasing volume of shunt. So the eye, in essence, is exposed to more blood, but more blood with a higher PO2. And interestingly, when we looked at the relationship between the composite outcome of death or severe ROP or ROP in survivors, PDA shunt and high volume shunt was a very strong associated after adjustment for all of these factors here, such that a PDA score of 78, and we'll come back to this later on, which reflects seven days of exposure to a high volume shunt, predicted ROP with a very high sensitivity and specificity. So prolonged exposure 
is important. So what is the optimal time of intervention and how do we move from where we are today? Well, currently the AAP statement suggests that early routine treatment to induce closure in the first two weeks does not improve long-term outcomes. Now, I would argue that this statement is very much based on previous trials, trials that probably should be expired that don't really help us answer this question. The fundamental thing one needs to think about is that there are entities like intraventricular hemorrhage, hypotension, pulmonary hemorrhage, which have been strongly associated with PDA. If you intervene beyond day seven, you're not going to be able to modulate any of these outcomes. Entities like neck BPD, which have also been associated with um, PDA exposure, are confounded by many things like infection, um, other uh, morbidities that happen, um, so that the concept is perhaps we need to think about if we are to strive to minimize these problems, perhaps we need to think a little bit earlier. So what evidence do we have that the early ductus is a problem? Well, this is a Danish study that I had the privilege to collaborate with, where they basically showed that the presence of a large PDA on day three of life was associated with an increase in both mortality, severe IVH, and necrotizing enterocolitis. The problem with early assessment is that it's imprecise. Parameters such as heart murmur, pulse pressure, really don't help you solve this problem. This is a nice study from a UK group where they looked at patients who had uh, big shunts after day seven recognized. And what they did was they looked at the clinical parameters in the first week of life that predicted late treatment. The only parameter that was associated with late treatment was metabolic acidosis. And certainly in our experience, metabolic acidosis is a important determinant, obviously of appraisal of the inadequacy of systemic hypoperfusion, but most of the parameters that we see fall into these categories. Worsening ventilation, increasing FiO2, hypotension, metabolic acidosis. You can manage these things from a symptom-based perspective, but neonatology needs to move away from symptom-based care to think more about diagnostic precision. And these constellation of symptoms may reflect PDA, but may also reflect pulmonary hypertension, heart dysfunction, sepsis. And our goal is to provide not just care, but to provide the best care, which requires the highest degree of diagnostic precision. It becomes very difficult when you're trying to look at the relationship between outcomes and symptoms. And we've learned this lesson from hypotension, for example. Better ways to do this are to define the phenotypes and look at the relationship between phenotypes and outcomes. So one of the other arguments in the AAP statement was that the ductus is not a problem biologically and physiologically in the first week of life because pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. This has not been our experience. This is a baby who is six hours old. And even by six hours, you can see the flow is all left to right. There's very dil marked dilation of the left heart, and there's compromise to postductal flow with an increase in reversal in the postductal arch, which is one of the most sensitive markers of shunt volume. This concept that the ductus truly is an issue early on was reiterated by another UK study where they did an echo which was blinded to the clinicians in the first 24 hours of life, and they then looked at the relationship between late treatment and the findings of that echo. And what they basically found was that patients who ultimately required therapy beyond day seven had large PDAs on day one of life. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at, and this is a observational study we conducted both in Canada and Ireland with Afif al um, what we can see is that there's two categories of patients. There are some babies who have large PDAs on day one that will close spontaneously. There are others that stay open. But the most telling findings here is that those babies identify themselves biologically. As pulmonary vascular resistance falls, the shunt volume will increase. And what you can see here is those patients, as early as the first 24 to 48 hours, have high flow in the pulmonary veins, have high left ventricular output that continues to rise, and they already have 
compromised diastolic flow to the descending arch, to the bowel, and also to the brain, suggesting that early echocardiography can help identify subpopulations at increased risk of abnormal profiles. And in this same paper, we looked at the relationship between um, a composite of echo markers, and this particular score was strongly associated with the composite outcome of death or BPD, such that a score more than six predicted this risk with a high sensitivity and specificity. It's important to look comprehensively, and uh, once upon a time, we thought that the atrial septum may actually uh, inhibit the reliability of the echo. We recently just published a paper in GIST actually suggests the opposite, that the atrial shunt is actually probably a physiological manifestation of bigger PDA shunts. And what you can see here is patients who have, in the first few days of life, larger PDAs and larger atrial communications actually have the highest volume of shunts. Pulmonary vein flow, cardiac output, compromised flow to the descending arch were all uh, much more pathologic in the presence of a large atrial communication, suggesting that an atrial communication in the presence of a PDA is another echo marker of hemodynamic significance. And what further adds to the argument and to the interest here is when we looked at the relationship of kind of PDA score, PDA diameter, and also atrial communication to um, uh, the risk of BPD or death, the presence of a large atrial communication in the first few days of life is an important parameter that we need to take care of and need to think about. So now thinking about what modulates flow, and I think this is one of the most underappreciated concepts with respect to PDA. We traditionally have thought of PDA closure in terms of giving drugs, drugs to close the ductus, but flow is determined not just by size of the vessel, although that's very important. It's cubed. Pressure difference, viscosity, and length also will increase the magnitude of the shunt. So I just want to take you for a couple of minutes on a slight tangent, which is what is the relationship of shunt to interventricular hemorrhage? And what is the cardiovascular argument uh, for uh, modulating flow? We know that low cardiac output in the first few hours of life is associated with bad hemorrhage. This is some data from Shahab Nouri's um, non-invasive cardiac output monitoring study. Babies who have stable cardiac output for the transitional period did not get IVH. Babies who started off with low cardiac output that increased rapidly in the first 48 hours of life were more likely to get severe IVH. So how might IVH be modulated, at least in part, by the presence of a large PDA shunt? Well, as mentioned, after birth, you remove the placenta, which is a low resistance capacitance organ. The left heart is now having to pump blood against a higher resistance, so you will have a low flow state. However, if the ductus remains open, as pulmonary vascular resistance falls, you're going to have an increase in the left to right shunt. You're going to have an increase in pulmonary venous return. So your cardiac output is going to rise. That cardiac output will be preferentially delivered to the brain. So the question is, is a open shunt with, as PVR falls, is that modulating an ischemia reperfusion event? And what's particularly interesting about this argument is if you think of the early trials of surfactant, nitric oxide, high frequency ventilation, all of which change PVR fairly radically, all were associated with an increased risk of IVH. So this is our hemodynamics room at the University of Iowa. We now are up to three echo machines. We have four faculty. Uh, we do kind of 90% of all the imaging work in the NICU. We do over 1,200 consultations. And as mentioned, this question to me became incredibly important. How can we better provide stability for the circulation in that first 24 hours of life. So we screen all our tiny babies and have done this now for uh, over 18 months. And based on the physiology 
we provide physiology specific care. So if there's heart dysfunction, we will manage that. If there's pulmonary hypertension, we will manage that. If there are moderate to large PDAs based on our echo scoring system, which again is comprehensive, uh, we will use Tylenol to modulate the shunt. This is a score that we use. And if the infants have a score of more than six, which reflects a moderate to high volume shunt, we will provide early targeted intervention. Why Tylenol? Well, part of the reason for, for Tylenol was internal concern. We use prophylactic hydrocortisone uh, for the first 48 hours in many babies, so concerned about the potential risk of intestinal perforation. Uh, but also, if you look at Shobik Mitra's kind of heat map study, kind of Tylenol kind of seemed to be a strong predictor of modulating vessel size in the first few hours of life. And what's particularly interesting about how Tylenol works is this is some work we conducted in Toronto where we looked at the impact on pulmonary vascular tone. We know from another study we did with Jeff Reese several years ago that it takes incredibly high doses of Tylenol to vasoconstrict the ductus. But what you can see here is that it has a vasoconstricting effect on the pulmonary vascular bed. So we believe that the reason Tylenol is working is that it's keeping your pulmonary vascular resistance a little elevated, which decreases the transductal pressure gradient and decreases flow across the duct to allow spontaneous closure to occur. So what's been our experience? And we've now studied over 150 babies. Okay, let me talk about some of the findings. So first, only 40% of patients actually have a ductus that's concerning. And these are babies less than 27 weeks gestation. I forgot to mention that. We don't screen the, 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 the older babies on day one. So that up to 40% of patients actually have a relative contraindication, one could argue, to PDA closure. They may have heart dysfunction, they may have pulmonary hypertension. So closing those PDAs with prophylactic endomethacin may induce harm. If we look at the primary reason for doing the study, this graph on the top right shows interventricular hemorrhage. The green is the Vermont-Oxford network for babies less than 24 weeks. The yellow is Iowa before the program, the orange is Iowa after the program. So you can see that even though our survival rates are much higher for tiny, tiny babies, our rates of severe IVH are the lowest in the network. Even for babies less between 24 and 26 weeks, you also see a very dramatic reduction in the instance of severe hemorrhage. Now, why is it relevant to today's, today's talk? Well, it's relevant to today's talk because one of the su two surprises we got were one, um, a fairly substantial reduction in the instance of severe BPD and a substantial reduction in the rates of necrotizing and enterocolitis, such that our rates of neck are only 1% now, which were unintended, unanticipated benefits of early targeted intervention. Our use of dopamine was reduced by 90%, our ligation rates have fallen. So again, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a single site center which has introduced a program in which we are now monitoring the impact of that program, but there is so much standardization